Hi everyone, thanks for joining me again on my YouTube channel. This is Workshop Quick Takes. I have here a 2000 Jeep Cherokee XJ, and like many XJ owners, I have and use the RKE module, the remote keyless entry. It is not an alarm system, it's just a simple way of doing lock, unlock, and also has a panic button. Very convenient, but unfortunately, the RKE module only works intermittently. If you look at the wiring diagrams, which are widely available online for this vehicle, it, you'll find out that from the RKE module, the harness, which comes through the roof, along the windshield, and then down, the very next interface it makes is to the door cluster here. Now, in a previous video, we took out the driver's side module and showed how to refurbish that. So I'm suspecting I've actually got a similar problem going on in here, and even though it's not affecting any of the locking or window action inside the vehicle, there's probably a bad connection coming down from the top to here, because everything up there seems kosher. So, we're going to pull out the door card, and then we're going to remove that module, take it apart, and see if we can clean it up, maybe resolder some broken connections. If you have watched that previous video, it's the exact same procedure. If you haven't, I'll just cover briefly what you need to do. So let's go ahead and see if it works. Nope, we're in a dry spell again, so have to unlock it manually. Just want to emphasize that the procedure here is exactly the same as we've done before. There are one, two, three screws in this side, just like there are on the driver's door. There's one back here behind this plate, and there's one over here. And then the perimeter around here is held in with plastic retention clips. We are going to use a plastic pry bar to remove those so that we don't bust the door to pieces. The cluster removes from the door trim card with screws, and then there are more screws on the back of the module. The switch caps are the tricky part. They do require an unreasonable amount of force and can disconnect at unreasonable speeds. Finally, work the perimeter tabs loose on the back with a shim. We had a copper scrap piece handy, but a better option is plastic, such as a laminated ID card. Well, take a close look, these connections are not nearly as bad as the one on the driver's side, but I do see a couple starting to crack and pop up, so that could be the source of our problems. Either way, we're in here now, so we're going to reflow all of those and see what that does for us. Quick notes on soldering, just in case you've never done that before. In this case, I've got a Weller WES-51 temperature controlled soldering station. I highly recommend something like this over versus just an off-the-shelf soldering iron that plugs straight in. Reason being is the temperature control is really useful. For this, I'm going to dial it down to about 700 Fahrenheit. These used to be top-line irons back in the day, so 30 years ago, you'd find one of these in the R&D section of every electronics company in Silicon Valley. These days, they're not used so much anymore because hand soldering is becoming kind of a lost art. So you can often find these for about a hundred bucks or so on eBay. If not, any kind of soldering station is better than none at all. The other thing you do want is you want a soldering sponge and it does need to be made for the application. You can usually buy these off the shelf. If you try and just use a kitchen sponge, it's probably made of some kind of thermoplastics. And so even if you wet it and do this, there's a good chance you're going to melt it. Also, you want solder. This is a 60-40 tin lead mix. Uh, most material, of course, is going to be ROHS and you'll be working with uh, lead-free solder. Lead-free solder has a higher reflow temperature and is less forgiving. So, yeah, even if environmentalism is your thing, keep in mind that if you're working with this, you're likely to get successful repairs. Something you repair successfully and continue to use is better for the environment than something you destroy and have to replace. Finally, have your work ready in a good, well-lit place where you can see it because you're going to need to get at it. Let's switch to a close-up macro view and see what it takes to get a good reflow. All right, now we've got our work in front of us, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tin the tip of the iron. Nice and hot. Wipe it on the sponge, and that gives me a nice, clean, shiny tip, which is what I need to really get a proper reflow. Then, I take the connection that I want to work on, and I put the iron next to it and touch a little bit of t solder to it, and then let that solder flow into it, and maybe just add a little bit more, and the flux that is in here then beads into the entire joint and makes a nice little conical shape there with a bit of a fillet on it. 
if you've got a big lump like this, unfortunately, original equipment one right here, then that's probably a bit too much solder. The fact that I could do that, yeah, that's not what you're looking for. But the main thing you're going to want to watch out for, especially in a situation like this where we have two connections very close together, is that you don't accidentally form a solder bridge between them because they can actually sometimes join each other right across like that. And although this is not an approved way of getting rid of excess solder, it does work in a pinch. The only thing is it can also pop out the connection that you were trying to do there. And if you accidentally knock out a part like we did there, just applying light pressure, and it's back in place. So that right there is a fair example of what you're looking for in a good, well reflowed solder joint. It's relatively shiny. It has a nice little fillet to it. It doesn't have too much solder balled up on top, but it also doesn't have too little. After soldering is complete, a thorough cleaning is helpful. This will flush old dirty grease out of the switch contact, so make sure to replenish it with clean grease. A light dielectric grease, sold in small packets for greasing spark plug boots, works pretty well here. Okay, should go back together faster than it came apart. If you took the plastic pieces apart carefully like we tried to this time, then they just snap right back together, no trouble. Then we gotta put the screws in the back, put the keycaps on, and finally it's gonna get installed in the door panel, but... Of course, you could just take this out right now, plug it into the harness and test it. We'll go ahead and install it in the door card first, but we won't reinstall the door card until it's fully tested. We'll just plug this in and see if it works. Okay, so plug in the connector here, connector here, reconnect the door pieces there, then snap all these back in and install the screws. See if that actually fixed it. Okay, we definitely made electrical contact there. Got the uh, test fire. Well, time will tell if that fixed it or not. It's being a little bit unresponsive. I'm not quite sure I understand that, but at least for now it's working again. So we'll find out. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again on another episode of Workshop Quick Takes. Hopefully you found that helpful. There's a problem you can go solve in your vehicle and I guarantee it's there whether or not it is causing problems yet. Now, problems like this can also implicate the door harness. We have a previous video on that, link in the description. Also, shared grounds. On the 9701, you have your main body fuse panel down inside the kick panel by the uh, passenger door. And a lot of circuits are made up there and there are also some shared grounds in that area. And if, especially if you have two circuits that seem to be interacting with each other when there's no explanation why, a lot of times it's probably a shared ground and a bad connection, especially on older vehicles that are going rusty. We did talk about soldering with lead today. Just make sure you wash your hands thoroughly and try not to scatter any debris you create when you uh, desolder around into the environment. Just get it into one trash can one place and dispose of it. It won't cause any problems after that. Don't use plumbing solder. Plumbing solder has a really strong acid core and it's almost impossible to get properly clean up a circuit board after using plumbing solder on it. And over time that acid will just eat away the traces and completely ruin it. Make sure you're using something that is specified as electrical solder. And to answer the final question, it turns out we did have a failing RKE module. Later on it stopped working again and we diagnosed that back to the module board itself. It does happen, but try to eliminate the easy stuff first, especially the stuff like this that is known to fail. So thanks for joining us again today, and we'll see you again next time, whenever that is. Has anyone seen my phone?